Welcome everyone to the award ceremony of the Volvo Environment Prize 2020. We have one very exciting hour ahead of us. I am Niklas Gustafsson. I'm the secretary to the board of the Volvo Environment Prize Foundation. We are today at Universeum, a science center in Gothenburg, Sweden. Here we can find uh, applied science and education with everything that has to do with sustainable development. Today's theme is biodiversity. And what better place to be than here at Universeum, where we can find everything from life in the deep oceans to the rainforests of Amazonas. This year, we give the award to a world-known uh, researcher on how humanity can feed itself while preserving biodiversity. Our laureate is researching how farmlands and agriculture can be changed to preserve wildlife. We will first have the first showing of a film on her research on the exciting biodiversity research of our laureate, Professor Claire Kremen. And she is actually with us today from a studio at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. Later on, we will be connecting with experts at WWF in Switzerland, University of California, Berkeley, University of Agricultural Science in Sweden, and of course, with our laureate at the University of British Columbia. And we will discuss what we can do to produce food sustainably and also protect biodiversity. Stay tuned for a very exciting panel to come. How much do you know about insects and what they actually mean to us? Soon you will get to know more. There will also be celebrations, entertainment, a royal greeting and much more. But first, what is the Volvo Environment Prize? And the idea is really to protect million square kilometers of this very important carbon sink. If we don't put a price tag on nature, we are effectively saying nature is worth nothing. We need the oceans more than the oceans need us. The sustainability will be won or lost in cities in the global south. You have to do more than just be an excellent scientist. You have to be an excellent scientist with impact on society to help us deal with the big problems. But the core, the base, the requirement is you must be a world-class scientist to get this award. I think we are witnessing a big mind shift, actually, from the idea of treating the environment as a sector to a strong recognition now that uh, we as a species, humans, are completely dependent on a functioning environment totally dependent on the Earth system and its thin biosphere that we're embedded in. And I think that recognition is moving really fast now, especially in the business community. With me today, I have the president and CEO of the Volvo Group, Martin Lundstedt. Welcome. Thank you very much, Niklas. Thank you. Nice to be here. Martin, this is the 31st year mm -hmm. of the award. Why did Volvo create the Volvo Environment Prize and the foundation? Very good question and first and foremost obviously because we believe in, in science. Uh, we believe in the outcome of science to make uh, fact-based uh, decisions in a complex world. And not at least then in the field of uh, environmental research uh, in a var variety of fields. Mm. And I should say that um, uh, environment, environmental care mm. is in the DNA of Volvo, mm. uh, in our core values and since a long time. Actually, uh, one week ago, we had the Capital Markets Day where we are outlining the strategy for the mm. years and decades to come. Mm. And one of the parts that was, of course, how do we uh, lead uh, the transportation system into a fossil-free one? Very exciting times. Mm. Mm. But it's beyond that, obviously. We have a lot to do uh, and uh, to learn more. Mm. And when we look upon the 30 uh, years of uh, uh, different type of awards in different fields, uh, different laureates, uh, we see not only the fantastic research, but also the impact 
it has uh, done on the sustainability agenda for politics, uh, for business, uh, and for us as citizens. Mm. And Martin, this, this award, Volvo mm. Environment Prize, is completely independent mm. from the Volvo Group. Why, why is that important? No, it is important. I mean, we are funding a, a foundation, mm. but the foundation must be important. Uh, independent mm. uh, because that uh, gives integrity and credibility mm. and uh, that's the reason why we have the setup with an independent jury uh, an independent scientific committee mm. uh, consisting of uh, world-class and well-experienced uh, scientists that are choosing area mm. and eventually uh, which must be very exciting also choosing the laureate mm. exactly uh, when the first prize was awarded back in 1990, mm. sustainability was actually not top of mind. Mm. Uh, but that has changed, yeah, obviously. A lot. Yeah. A lot. And what, what, uh, what do you see ahead of us uh, with this? No, but first and foremost, I think everyone sees that uh, many trends are not heading in the right direction. Uh, mm. So sustainability is a very, very critical item for uh, humanity, mm. uh, for the planet, uh, for society at large, but also for business. Mm. Not only to be part of business in the future, but to, the, to be the winner. Yeah. And uh, at Volvo, as we have said, we have outlined our strategy, uh, of course, our commitments to a number of important in international agreements mm. uh, to, to lead that work together with a lot of other stakeholders, mm. uh, Paris Agreement, yeah. uh, science-based targets to get us there, mm. uh, green finance framework, but also how we do it and how we execute it in Volvo through for example, electrification, mm. both battery and fuel cells. And I can continue forever, <laughs> yes. and, yes. but it's not by talking about us today. It's mm. talking about uh, another very important field that I think a lot of business leaders uh, need to learn more about. Mm. Uh, biodiversity and the, the link that has to business when it comes, for example, to sustainable food production, land use, mm. growing population. So uh, mm. very exciting uh, mm. hour ahead of us. Excellent. Martin, you will uh, be with us also mm. later for the award ceremony to Professor Claire Kremen. Mm. And um, uh, now we have a tradition at the Volvo Environment Prize to do a film about the laureate and to send a film team to the laureate's home and workplace. Obviously, this year with the pandemic, we had to do it differently. But a film there is Absolutely. in two parts, actually. And uh, we are talking about biodiversity today. So science and environment journalist Klaus Sjöberg started with the researcher who was the first one out to map the enormous variety of biodiversity on Earth, Carl von Linné. This is the home of Carl von Linné, the Swedish botanist who invented modern taxonomy, that is the way we name organisms. When he lived here some 250 years ago, agriculture was very different. Humans, or Homo sapiens, as Linné named our species, did not have much impact on biodiversity. But today, modern agriculture, forestry and ranching is efficient. It's mechanized and it's giving high yields. But what is it doing to the wildlife, plants and insects? The world is losing species at an alarming rate and the transformation of forests and wild areas into farmlands is pushing wildlife into steep decline. This is the research area of this year's Volvo Environment Prize laureate, Claire Kremen. And she has a solution of how to keep feeding the planet while preserving wildlife. We need to get rid of monoculture style of farming and manage our working lands for biodiversity. We simply wouldn't survive without biodiversity. It's responsible for the air that we breathe, for cleaning up our water, for the food that we eat, all of these things. Traditionally protected areas such as reserves and national parks have been the cornerstones of biodiversity conservation. Absolutely, there are many species that we're only going to be able to protect in that manner. But right now, across the world, we have about 15% of the world's surface that's protected and so much is left outside. 
The lands where humans are farming, doing forestry and ranching make up between 60 to 70 percent of the terrestrial Earth's surface. These so-called working lands are often managed in a way detrimental to wild plants, animals and insects. With very large-scale agriculture, we're simplifying the landscapes a lot. It makes them much less habitable for most species. Today's industrialized agricultural systems are not efficient at all. They're producing many environmental externalities. They are paying people less than a living wage, which pushes the social services cost onto the public. And they've contributed to public health disaster in the form of diet-related diseases. So if you think about all of those costs, it's not efficient at all. According to a recent report by the conservation group WWF, the wildlife population has fallen by more than two-thirds in less than 50 years. They recorded an average 68% fall in more than 20,000 species of mammals, birds, amphibians, reptiles and fish since 1970. Less known is the decline of insects. Claire Kremen is an expert on wild bees and says she's concerned about the insects' declines. I think it's very serious. Insects are the little things that run the world. Pollinators are critical for our own survival. They provide us with a third of the food that we eat. They improve the production of 75% of crop species, including some that we particularly enjoy, like chocolate and coffee but also those that are critical for providing us with essential vitamins like A, C, and E. So we really, really need these guys. Near Carl von Linnea's summer home, there is a branch of the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences where Professor Ricardo Bumarco, a research colleague to Claire Kremen, works with research on insects and crop protection. Insects is biodiversity. Half of all larger organisms are insects. They are doing much more than just pollinating. They decompose, they protect our crops against insects that want to eat them. So they are extremely important for many, many reasons. Without any bee visits, there is no harvest. Often the farmers will rent honeybees and bring them out to the farm fields to supply that pollination service. But honeybees are actually not very effective at pollinating blueberry. Instead, the wild pollinators like bumblebees are extremely good at pollinating blueberry because they grasp the flower and shake it at a specific frequency that is just right for getting the pollen out. The problem is, is on huge fields like this one, there are not other resources for the bumblebees and other pollinators to support them. And another problem is that in these very large fields, they're often subject to pest outbreaks. It's a terrible problem for farmers. And farmers then have to spray pesticides over and over to control it. The good news, though, is that we can really reverse this trend. A way to do it is by transforming the working lands to make them more diverse. We would see the different crops growing within the same field. And then around that field, we'd have different kinds of vegetation, like hedgerows, which line the field, shrubs and trees. We'd have pastures and small areas of native vegetation, like woodlots and small forests, borders along streams. I think that people would find them very attractive. Critics of this type of farming and the concept of agroecological landscapes say that they are much less productive, with smaller yields in a world where the human population is approaching 8 billion people. I would push back on that. Surprisingly, biodiversity-based farming can actually be as or more productive than conventional farming systems. It's about outputs over inputs. Many of today's assessments of agriculture are looking at just one kind of output, which is yield. So we need new models for how to feed the growing population. And here, biodiversity comes into play. We can work with biodiversity and instead of against it. Working in agriculture really opened my eyes to the problems in our food system, but also how we can solve them by farming with and for biodiversity. I wasn't surprised at all to hear that Claire Kremen was awarded the Volvo Environment Prize.
We will soon get to know more about our laureate in part two of the film. And now we will meet with two colleagues of Professor Claire Kremen. You have actually already seen them in the film. First, Professor Hannah Whitman on the future of food production and how to produce food sustainably. Since agricultural communities emerged almost 10,000 years ago, people have been living with nature in working landscapes. Indigenous communities have cultivated and stewarded vast tracts of forests, rangelands, fisheries. It's only in the last um, half a century, really, that our landscapes have become highly simplified. So if we think about the long duration of agricultural progress, I think we need to look at the traditional ways that uh, working landscapes were managed by diverse communities and looking at um, the long-term sustainability of those resources. And diversity was a big piece of that. So in rangelands and in forests, it's about taking what is needed now without harming the ability of future generations to access those resources. It's not a stretch. It requires environmental regulation. It involves knowledge and education for consumers about the shape that they'd like to see their food system. Um, it involves supporting food providers, ranchers, and farmers to <clears throat> be supported for the conservation of ecosystem services that they've been stewarding for generations. So food production will always change in the future. The question is in what direction? So Claire Kremen's prize for understanding the role of working landscapes in biodiversity conservation is a really key piece of the puzzle of changing agriculture towards more sustainability in the future. And that, alongside other technological approaches, um, hopefully will make a big difference. As we saw earlier, pollinating insects are absolutely essential for agriculture and for food production. But most of us are probably not aware of how crucial insects are for life on Earth. Let's find out more together with Professor Ricardo Bomarco. Ricardo, when we think about insects, a lot of th people think they are disgusting. We're, we're scared of them, like uh, mosquitoes, ants, wasps, etc. Are we wrong in thinking so? No, we, there are insects that are surely damaging or problematic to humans, especially if badly managed. But there are only a few uh, species of, of maybe a few hundred species of all the many, many, many insects that are around that are doing good things for us. There's a famous biologist, E.O. Wilson, who said that uh, humans could disappear from the planet. Life would go on as usual, but if insects disappeared overnight, humans wouldn't survive for more than a few months. Is it that bad? Yes, probably, although I can't fathom a world without insects. I mean, they would survive us, especially uh, the way we are acting today with our planet. Yeah, I mean, they're doing so many things that are absolutely necessary for us. We wouldn't get enough vitamins because there wouldn't be plants that were pollinated that uh, we could eat. There wouldn't be a decomposition that would go fast enough, so we would have a planet full of cadavers and uh, feces that would swamp our planet, and terribly boring also, because there would be very little biodiversity. <laughs> So how could we best use the ecosystem services provided to us by insects? Well, we have to understand how they work, how they tick, their ecology. We need to understand that so that we can manage our ecosystems, for instance, agriculture and forestry and urban settings, so that we increase the abundance of the beneficial insects and also thereby decrease the abundance of the damaging insects so that we get more food on our tables, basically. Mm -hmm. What do you think we should teach children about insects? Well, first of all, we should not teach them that insects are icky, because children from the start usually do not think that insects are icky or, or bad. That's something that we teach them. They're interested and curious about insects, and we should promote that, because insects is a wonderful way to see biodiversity the enormous range of uh, adaptation and colors and forms and life histories that insects have is an amazing way of getting into understanding and seeing nature and getting in touch with nature. Thank you very much, Ricardo. And we'll see more of you uh, when it's time for the panel discussion in a little while.
Thank you, Ricardo and Klaas. Ricardo will be with us again in a bit. Before we move into the award ceremony, let's get to know our laureate a little bit better. I always loved animals as a child, and then studying biology it was my favorite subject. As an idealistic teenager, I wanted to somehow contribute to solving the world food hunger crisis. And an advisor suggested that I focus on fundamentals. So I studied ecology, evolution, and developmental biology as an undergraduate, and then for my PhD. But by the end of my PhD, I had become very concerned about the loss of rainforests. And I decided to switch to become a tropical conservation biologist. I got this fantastic opportunity to go to Madagascar and to work with Malagasy people in establishing a number of new protected areas. Very exciting work. We worked at the same field site, but we worked in the opposite season. So when I would arrive, she would have just departed and we worked with the same field crew. So my job was to live up to her reputation as a project manager, <laughs> because they would often remark, you know, well, Claire does it like this, and it works very well like that. So I knew of Claire for several years by reputation. She's a superstar, incredibly curious. I think that she's also incredibly kind for someone of that ambition. I think her secret is time management. <laughs> I think she's very smart with her time. And she's very clever. When you're with Claire, you don't feel that you're with a big professor. She's very open, she's very engaging. I would describe Claire as actually quite a serious person. No mission is too big and she doesn't have any fear. She strives for excellence in like every part of it. Her research is amazing and what really was, I was struck by it is her ability to synthesize new information all the time. Claire is kind of a master to me, an example to follow, but also a source of inspiration and also a person to ask for opinion, especially when I'm in difficult situations. <laughs> Seven years ago, I got very interested in permaculture gardening, so I transformed my backyard. I did it because I wanted to walk the talk and see what it was like to grow your own food and do it with sustainable management techniques. And I have to say, it was so much fun. I really got excited about it. So I became a much better cook, and I'm really interested now in this farm-to-table kind of cooking. Her lighter side is not like a funny, hysterical side. Her lighter side is a graceful side, her physicality, which you might see in her karate. It's something where I'm so focused, everything else goes away. And it's a huge physical and mental challenge. I like challenges. I saw some videos on YouTube and I saw Claire fighting with two dudes and she was like flipping them over. She's not only amazing in science, but also outside science. It's the girl. Martin, uh, this is the th 31st year of the award. What are your thoughts about it? Uh, first and foremost, when you see this uh, film, I'm very glad that it is the uh, 31st year. Uh, I mean, it has been consistency, mm. but it's also, in a way, unfortunately, a growing uh, emergence of this subject. Uh, and, and also not only to cherish uh, laureates, but all the hardworking scientists and researchers around the globe. And you see it, it is a lot of field work, dedication, motivation. So. Uh, I think it's to, to cherish the whole community and how they are solving and putting forward facts about uh, the sustainability challenges. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a good opportunity now to say that, uh, including this year, we have actually 48 uh, mm. fantastic laureates. Mm. And I think we should uh, take the opportunity to take a look up on what they have achieved.
And now over to Vancouver. It is now our pleasure to connect with Professor Claire Kremen at the University of British Columbia. Hi there, Claire. Hello. Hello, Claire. Hello, From Nicholas. my side as well. Martin, you are now ready here mm -hmm. with, with the award. Mm -hmm. uh, but before we will go to the official handover, mm -hmm. Let's hear from the prize jury citation from the chairman, Professor Will Stephan in Canberra, Australia. Thank you, Nicholas. It's a great pleasure for me to read the jury's decision and the citation that we wrote for this year's laureate. Underlying the immediate crises that humanity is facing in 2020 are deeper challenges, none more important than halting the global decline in biodiversity while feeding a growing human population and addressing climate change. Professor Claire Kremen is a world leader in research and action to reconcile food production with biodiversity conservation and the maintenance of other ecosystem services. Her diversified farming systems approach, guided by the need for a fundamental change in agricultural systems, has created a new direction for sustainable food production. Combining field studies with conceptual and empirical research, her systems-oriented approach is built on a bottom-up integration of pollinators, invertebrates, and other oft-forgotten but critical components of resilient ecosystems to create a more diversified farming system. Professor Kremen developed techniques that farmers can apply on their own land and has provided scientific advice, outreach, and policy guidance to local, national, and international NGOs farmers, academic groups, government agencies, and policy organizations for the maintenance and restoration of pollinator and invertebrate communities in agricultural landscapes. In summary, her work on diversified farming systems and conservation has helped us to understand how the increasingly globalized food system affects biodiversity, sustainability, and equity, and most importantly, how to significantly improve this system so that we can feed ourselves while protecting biodiversity and mitigating climate change. Professor Claire Kremen is the most deserving recipient of the 2020 Volvo Environment Prize. Thank you, Will. Thank you. I wish I could be there to do it in person. <laughs> <laughs> and now over to you, Martin. Thank you, Niklas. Now it's time for uh, the award. Uh, and the award uh, consists of uh, this uh, special made glass uh, sculpture by artist Erika Lagerbjelke, one of the Swedish specials, and also a, a handmade and also a very uh, special diploma, only for you, uh, Professor Kremen, and also 1.5 million Swedish crowns. So it is really a true honor uh, for me as the chairman of the Volvo Environment Prize Foundation to convey our warmest congratulations uh, to you for your fantastic and outstanding achievements in the field of biodiversity and to award you to the 2020 uh, laureate of the Volvo Environmental Prize, Professor Claire Kremen, our rock star <laughs> and uh, our hope for the future. Congratulations. <laughs>
So thank you so much, Volvo Foundation, for supporting Working Lands Conservation through this award, for making this amazing documentary and media event to communicate these ideas. No scientific activity occurs in a vacuum, and I especially want to thank my wonderful students and colleagues around the world, past and current, for your incredible collaboration in this work. I hope you're feeling proud too, because this prize is for all of us. And finally, I want to thank my dear family and friends. My husband and daughter are here with me in the studio. My mother is listening in from across the continent. My father would be so proud. He lives forever in my heart. To all my family and friends listening, your love and support means so much to me. Thank you very much, Claire. And now we have a message from the Royal Court in Sweden, Her Royal Highness Crown Princess Victoria. Professor Crennan, ladies and gentlemen, loss of biodiversity is one of the greatest challenges facing humanity today. Extinction of animals, plants, and other organisms threaten life support systems on which we depend, like food, fresh air, and clean water. In fact, healthy ecosystems are essential to achieving most of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, for which the deadline is now merely 10 years away. This is what we know, and that should be enough to take action. But on top of that, there is so much that we don't know yet. In the search for new medicines, clean fuels, and ways to feed a global growing population, biodiversity is a critical factor. Our forests and oceans are full of discoveries just waiting to be made. Keys to solving our world's big challenges. Keys we simply cannot afford to throw away. We need to gain a deeper knowledge about our complex ecosystems and a broader understanding of how very fragile they are. Science provides us with this and helps us make the right decisions for the future. Ladies and gentlemen, in a time when so much revolves around the acute problems caused by the ongoing pandemic, it is important that we don't lose sight of the bigger picture and the long-term challenges that humanity faces. In light of this, initiatives such as the Volvo Environment Prize are more important than ever. Professor Krenin, please accept my warmest congratulations on this recognition of your important work and the best of luck with your continued research. Last week, the foundation launched a new website for the award. In preparation for that, we mapped all the laureates for the 31 years and their university or organization affiliation. This list is now to be found on the website. And there are two universities in the world with the most prize winners, actually four of them each. Stanford University in California and University of British Columbia, Vancouver, Canada. We asked the UBC president, Santa Ono, about this and their efforts in biodiversity research. Hello. I'm Santa Ono, President and Vice Chancellor of the University of British Columbia. On behalf of UBC, I would like to congratulate Clara Kremen, the 2020 Volvo Environment Prize Laureate. I'm so pleased that Professor Kremen, who holds the President's Excellence Chair in Biodiversity, has received this well-deserved recognition. She is indeed an outstanding ecologist and applied conservation biologist. Key to her work is preventing and reversing the loss of biodiversity, one of the greatest environmental challenges facing humanity in the 21st century. 
UBC understands that uniting scientists with different disciplinary perspectives and expertise offers the best hope for solutions to large-scale problems such as biodiversity loss. Indeed, UBC is home to one of the world's leading groups currently studying biodiversity, global change, and the potential solutions to challenges associated with these changes. I'm proud to say that Professor Kremen is the fourth UBC researcher to be awarded the Volvo Environment Prize, joining Rashid Sumaila, Daniel Pauli, and Carl Walters. In fact, UBC is tied with Stanford University for the most number of Volvo Prize recipients in the world. And we're working to bring yet more outstanding biodiversity researchers to UBC through a new cluster hiring initiative, a reflection of UBC's commitment to sustainability and our international strength in biodiversity, ecological research. Once again, congratulations to you, Claire. We're very proud of you. We now turn to the panel discussion. How to feed humanity and also preserve wildlife and biodiversity. With us here we have today our laureate, of course, Professor Claire Kremen. We also have Professor Ricardo Bomarco, who you have seen earlier on in the videos. And also Nina Ishikawa, who is the director of the Berkeley Food Institute. We are also pleased to have the, on this panel Marco Lambertini, the Secretary General of WWF, the world's largest conservation organization. Thank you all for participating. Uh, my first question goes to you, Marco Lambertini. The WWF report, Living Planet, shows a dramatic decline in number of species and wildlife. How much of this can be attributed to the expansion of human activities such as agriculture and forestry? Well, first of all, it is indeed a shocking result. We're talking about two-third decline of global wildlife population in less than 50 years. This is a blink of an eye compared to the millions of years the species have been living on the planet. And it's absolutely clear the cause of all this is us, particularly the way we produce and consume food, fishing in the ocean, overfishing rather, in the ocean and agricultural land. 80% of deforestation is driven by agricultural expansion and pasture for cattle. I turn my next question then to Nina Ishikawa. Your mission at the Berkeley Food Institute is to transform food systems to expand access to healthy and affordable food. Do you see any signs of this actually happening? Yes, we're, it's really an amazing time right now to work in food systems, and we're so proud of Claire and all the work that she's done to get us to this point. I hope you can hear me okay? Absolutely. Okay, great. Um, well, a few of the signs that we see this is happening, one is that there's increased transparency in our food system, and for that, I have to thank both the scientists, but also the journalists for all their hard work to open our eyes to previously uh, secret or um, just pushed under the rug parts of our food system. Um, part of that increased transparency has led us to look at wages, um, what workers are doing in the food system, and relocalizing our food system. All of these uh, signs are transforming food systems. Excellent, Nina. Thank you very much. I turn to you, Claire, now. And a question here, will farmers have to accept lower yields if they were to implement a strategy of more diverse so-called working lands? Well, not necessarily, Nicholas, because we have growing evidence that these diversification practices can maintain or sometimes even improve yields over more simplified systems. And um, really what needs to happen is that Often when farmers transition to these practices, they might experience lower yields initially. So we really need to provide programs that help farmers make these transitions. And the other thing that we critically need, uh, as the Crown Princess said, is additional research in this important area so that we can fine tune and find the best combination of diversification practices for specific crops in specific regions. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you, Claire. Maybe this is a lead to you then, Ricardo Bomarco. It may sound uh, good to use insects for crop protection instead of chemicals then, but how complicated will it actually be there for, to handle this for farmers in practical terms, you think? Well, it depends on which crop and which pest uh, we're talking about. But in many cases, uh, nothing much will change because a lot of pesticides are used unnecessarily, really, uh, or for uh, insurance. And so we could have an insurance system to the farmer that would replace the, that risk that you would take by not spraying. But uh, surely there are some cases that where you would need more uh, knowledge and engagement, and of course the knowledge we've talked about, we need more research to provide the farmer with uh, uh, workable options. And uh, and when it turns the time when we talk about engagement, well that means that it will take more time for the farmer to work with this. And there we have to basically give them a little bit, a little bit larger piece of the cake. Uh, because many farmers today are squeezed between high input costs and low output prices. So, so that's we need to give them more uh, economical maneuver also when there is a real pest problem to be solved. Yeah, thank you very much, Ricardo. I have a question for you here, Marco. Um, climate change is something, of course, that many companies uh, are deeply involved in nowadays. Um, and But I think that the issue of biodiversity is relatively new to many companies. What is your message to companies that think that biodiversity is actually not their responsibility? Well, first of all, climate change and biodiversity loss has always been considered as two separate issues. This is not true. We are understanding they are interconnected. Climate change is driving uh, nature loss, for example, forest fires, and, and for example, forest fires, nature loss is exacerbating climate change. So they are the two sides of the same ecological challenge. And, uh, and I would say uh, biodiversity and nature loss is as dangerous, it should be as concerning as climate change for the reason I just said, the link to climate, uh, but also because of all the services nature provides to us every day for free. Think about pollination, fish in the ocean, uh, water regulation, coastal protection, local weather, uh, rainfall patterns, stability. All this is invaluable to us, to our society, to our economy. And so it's not just a moral duty to coexist with nature, it's also because by losing nature, we're actually threatening our climate, our food, our water, our health, as we know from the COVID crisis, and ultimately our economy and society. So uh, this is a fundamental issue that needs to be tackled together with climate change. Thank you, Marco. Um, I, so what you say is actually that everything is interlinked, climate change and biodiversity, it all sticks together. If I turn to Nina again here, um, don't you think there is a risk for uh, transforming the food industry and agriculture to be more biodiversity friendly and sustainable? Why will that not also mean higher food prices? Well, potentially, but not necessarily. And the point you just made about our systems being interlinked is absolutely true. And it's at the core of what we do at the Berkeley Food System, Berkeley Food Institute. We have to consider our economic, political, as well as environmental systems at the same time, as difficult as that is, so that we don't uh, shove the problems from one system over onto another. Um, I do think that as more farming systems transition to a more uh, biodiverse system, we will have economies of scale, um, everything from equipment to policies to um, supply chains that make it easier for farmers and more affordable for consumers. We do have to uh, reject a race to the bottom and consider if certain practices do end up being more expensive, how can we ensure that all people can We've also found that sustainable food systems uh, can grow jobs and lead to more jobs for more people, leading to more people being able to afford them. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Nina. Very interesting this on, 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 uh, on really following the race to the bottom and, and, and also how to see then how we can actually create more jobs in, in, in farming. And if I turn this a little bit to you, Claire, again then, uh, maybe we see this in the research, of course, but have you seen interest outside of the academic world for your thoughts on the need for a more diverse landscape? Well, yes, absolutely, Nicholas. Um, I have seen this uh, in, with farmers, for example, 
you know, if they are experiencing a lack of productivity in their lands, if the lands have become unproductive, then these kinds of diversification practices are a great way to restore the health of those lands, restore the soil fertility, restore the productive capacity. And um, a wonderful example comes from one of our most intensively farmed regions in North America, the U.S. Corn and Soy Belt. And there, um, there's a wonderful book called Wildly Successful Farming. And in this book, uh, the author chronicles a number of different farmers who have done exactly that. They've created these biodiverse farms that are productive and profitable. And to Marco's point, they're actually more resilient as well when uh, extreme weather events like droughts, which are afflicting the region, happen. And so um, the, other, the other main group, I think, that is beginning to take up these ideas are businesses, food, food companies, uh, because they're, you know, they're getting wise to this too, that uh, they need um, a, a, a supply chain they can count on. And they, um, they are looking at climate change um, and the loss of biodiversity as risk factors to their supply chain. Uh, so um, there's a group of businesses, about 40 now, in a coalition that are working to incentivize farmers for these more restorative, diversified practices. Um, and it's exactly for that region, reason, to protect biodiversity um, and improve the farming systems and make them more resilient. Um, that's very interesting, Claire, and I, I think we can all acknowledge the, the, what you say here about more extreme weather. And, and it's nice to hear that, we, that the industry is actually listening into research here. But one thing that strikes me a little bit uh, when talking about this way of farming in agriculture and so on, I'm, I'm turning to you, Ricardo, again. Uh, I mean, if, if we, instead of these large monocultures, would switch to a more diverse landscape, uh, doesn't that actually resemble what agriculture landscapes looked like like 100 years ago or something like that? Should we go back in time? No, I mean, we definitely need to diversify our landscapes, as you've, as you've shown in the documentary. And uh, and we will be able to produce enough there, I'm, I'm sure. I mean, that's what our recent research is showing us. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we have to go back to the old style farming that we had. Uh, instead, we need to modernize agriculture, I would say, uh, so that it aligns with the basic ep uh, ecological principles and the boundaries that nature sets for us. Uh, so it has to match the scales at which biodiversity operates. And this is a particularly important for the biodiversity that is supporting our production, such as pollinating insects. It's the most pedagogical example. But we also have a, a number of natural enemies to pests that suppress the pests and decrease the need for us to use pesticides. And if we uh, construct the landscape so that they can survive there year after year after year, we will have a crop protection for free. And, and the, this um, modernized agriculture, diversified agriculture, will have, will need technologies to support it. Modern variety, breeding varieties, bread varieties, machines, drones, precision agriculture, all of that uh, uh, developed so that it supports these new diversified cropping systems. Okay, thank you very much, Ricardo. Uh, a, qu a, qu a complex question to you, Marco, but I ask for a rather quick answer if possible. Uh, your message is that we must take action now for nature to actually recover. If you have to choose and only give me one simple answer on this, what, what would, would be your first priority? Maybe I'm going to tell you something that surprises you, uh, because, of course, we talk about food as one of the main drivers of nature loss and climate change today. But I would say the most important thing is, uh, is our, our mind, uh, is how we relate and we think of nature. And uh, we need to stop taking nature for granted, as we are doing now, and we need to start valuing nature. And understand that at the end of the day, we depend on nature more than nature depends on us. So I will turn again now to, to Claire. Um, so my question to you, Claire, now, um, what would be your best advice for the farmers, but also for people with small gardens to preserve biodiversity and also the insects? Yes, it's what I said in the film. It's really important to diversify within the field 
Uh, multiple crops, those multiple crops can improve productivity and, re and also reduce pest damage. Um, complex rotations that support soil health and soil biodiversity. And then it's, it's a multiple scale thing around the fields with hedgerows um, and flower strips that provide habitat for the various beneficial insects and other organisms. And then in the farming landscape, patches of natural habitat. And as Ricardo was saying, if we do all these things, then we can really reduce the need for pesticide use, perhaps even eliminate it altogether. Um, and for home gardeners, it's the same. Plant a wonderful diversity of foodstuffs and flowers and don't use pesticides because you won't need to. Thank you very, very much, Claire. And that has to be the final comment now from this uh, discussion. Many thanks to all of you in this panel for participating at the Volvo Environment Prize Award. And now I turn to you, Martin. Thank you, Niklas. And uh, your Royal Highness, dear laureate friends, uh, first and foremost, I will uh, actually repeat what I said in the beginning. Uh, we believe in science, and I hope that this uh, event has shown the importance of science and the outcome of the findings of all great scientists, and how we actually can apply that also to make the world a better place. Uh, the subject of biodiversity and that how that is correlated also with climate change has really been a great uh, story for me and I think the ability for us all to learn and see how we can apply that both in our daily life but most important also in our businesses to turn the tide. So is it possible then to meet all these uh, sustainability challenges and I'm a born optimist and we are born optimists in, in the group of Volvo. Uh, and uh, we will do it together, of course. But it's also important a day like this to say that we need to step up now. We need really to take the facts coming out of science and to make actions out of it. And uh, of course, we are looking forward in the whole community ecosystem, not at least everyone that is watching, to really cooperate together and looking forward to do that. And again, the warmest congratulations to this year's laureate. Uh, 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 Professor Claire Kremen. Thank you very much for today. We hope that you have enjoyed the event. So we end up by saying bye-bye to everyone. Thank you. See you bye. next year.